Today's section is very special and very close to my heart. In fact, I can say it's, it's my heart. It's my heart being poured out. <clears throat> In today's fast-paced world, where everything is rushing and racing, we say first impression is the last impression. If you can get them in the first three seconds or first 30 seconds, you get them. Otherwise, nobody has the time for you. In the new age, healers and therapists, facilitators, gurus and teachers fall prey to this. Speed. This speed of the outside, the racing speed, we have started to become quicker so one can impress. You can be impressed, the seeker. Your attention can be commanded. But do you know, and I hope you do, that in the inner journey is the absolute opposite. In the inner journey, the first impression is not possible to be the last impression. It's not possible. Because in the inner journey, you never end up being who you were. You are inhalated. You're gone. Why am I telling you all this? Because today I'm going to talk about inhalation. Today I'm going to talk about Sufi mystic Mother Rabia. In my last live, I told you that the Naval Awakening Initiation, which changed my life, literally, introduced me to my life purpose. This Naval Awakening Initiation was founded by Sufi mystic Mother Rabia. What is this Naval Awakening Initiation? How do you feel when you get this initiation? What results does it bring to you? What can you expect from receiving the initiation? These questions hold no relevance if you don't know who, the, who is the person giving you the initiation. Because these questions they come from spiritual immaturity. They come from the space of the buyer. Because you're going to invest your money in it. You're going to invest your time and effort in it. You're going to invest yourself in it. You better know that it's worth it. Because falling and failing is not a part of your plan. But in the inner journey, falling and failing is the plan. Annihilation is the plan. Now when I say Sufi mystic, Mother Rabia, Sufi mystic. You know, in this racing world, because we don't have time, we have stereotyped everything. Everything is a stereotype because it's so much easier to put something into a box, label it that and refer to it forever in that sense. Why bother? Why know? Why find out? Why dig? Let's label it. I don't have the time. So Sufis, Sufis and mystics and gurus have become stereotypical. Gurus, the word guru in the ancient system, in the ancient Indian wisdom, whenever one said the word guru, one would hold the ear. That means I am not in, even worth taking the name. And today we call the technical experts, good dancers, or any kind of experts, chefs, he or she is the guru of their field.
no expert is a guru gurus are not experts gurus are not the top notch of their field that's not what a guru is and so sufis mystics gurus all have become stereotyped you have a label so what is the biggest label that we have on sufis sufi mystics darwish the whirling darwish of turkey of konya connecting them directly to rumi or the sufi darwish who sing who are devoted who wear whatever they like that's it they sung their heart that's it but the whole sufism and the mysticism the mysticism of the sufis is so deep so profound so divine it cannot be labeled it cannot be explained with couple of lines there's no definition to it sufis are not necessarily religious leaders sufis are not people who have any knowledge or wisdom necessarily of any religious scriptures and more importantly sufis are not the people who bother or care about it they are sufis because they are mast malang what is the meaning of mast and malang mast is someone who you or me would consider a mad person mad mad in relevance of the society the society functions in a chronologic chronological fashion and the mad person goes upstream it makes no sense there is no logical sense why is the mad person going upstream when we are flowing down when the society is flowing down but the mad person knows that swimming upstream all that effort is worth it because it's going to reach home the society doesn't know that it may be flowing very smoothly right now but it's going nowhere nowhere in particular it may be going and merging into the ocean but it's going nowhere in particular yes or no meher baba loved musts yes meher baba is one of the ascended masters who guides sufi mystic mother rabia he is her direct ascendant master just for your information so sufis are not whirling darwishes sufis are not religious leaders sufis are not people who necessarily have any knowledge about scriptures or most importantly they don't care about scriptures sufis are people who you consider mad in relevance to the society sufis are the people whose universal heart has awakened the universal heart is the heart of the god the universal heart is the heart of the entire existence and the sufi's heart beats with the universe so whatever is relevant to you is relevant to you because you have your causal heart your conditioned heart but the sufi's heart is beating with the universe it has a rhythm and this rhythm is what drives the sufi so the sufi may be doing one thing right now will do absolutely the opposite in the next moment it may make no sense to you but it makes all the sense to the universe you may have heard a lot about zen masters and sufi mystics you may have heard a lot about zen masters sufi mystics and yogis the one thing that you may have heard a lot about them is how whimsical they are they are whimsical because we don't get their logic but they are not whimsical 
they are attuned to the higher plane they are attuned to the universal plan they are attuned to the universal understanding they can see the bigger picture sufi mystic mother rabia how can a drop describe the ocean is it possible maybe not but let's describe her she is sufi because she walks her path without the need for anybody's validation but mind you she is not kali and she is not durga and she is not somebody who comes across as fierce she is somebody who comes across drenched in love she is somebody who comes across poor she comes across innocent that's who she is she's playful she's not fierce she doesn't scare you you relax your boundaries with her you relax your guards and you start to play with her you start to dance with her you start to sing with her and you start to make chai which she loves and you make that tea and making that tea making that chai drinking that chai with her and talking and laughing is the greatest religious and spiritual practice that is practiced in her field there are no dogmas there is no knowledge there is no intellectualization there are no asking her questions intellectual questions knowledgeable questions and there are no spiritual arguments or discussions there's only sharing sharing of one playful sufi with another because she considers you one there is no discrimination there is no hierarchy there is no boss there is only a mother and there is only a child and the mother and child together find the universal rhythm sufi mystics there have been many many sufi mystics and you would have heard of a thousands a, th- a thousand or thousands of male sufi mystics but you would have heard of very few female sufi mystics the reason behind this is the female psychology the female sufi mystics or female mystics are very few because the female the feminine is the mother and mother is to nurture and nurturance requires you to have the conditioned heart active that means the nurturance requires you to have empathy sympathy resonance compassion sacrifice these are elements of the divine feminine these are elements of the mother they are easier to let go for a man for a male for the divine masculine but these are elements that are not easy for a female to let go of because every fiber of her nature is steeped in sacrifice in receiving in nurturing in providing in empathizing and sympathizing in compassion and so very few women are able to leave their conditioned heart behind their causal heart behind and just merge with the universal heart most of the female sufi mystics most of the female mystics are women who you will never know about because they are women who run their homes and families and in the time that nobody is watching they do their ibadat their worship and that's when they come to know who they are but they keep it with themselves you know mother rabia has a has her own routine and she wakes up at 2 or 3 in the morning sometimes sometimes 4 and she goes for her what we can call meditation but i call it a routine 
Ibadat is the best word. Ibadat is a very beautiful word. Actually, there is no relevant word in any other language, especially not in English. Ibadat. Uh, the word in English is worship, but worship doesn't taste as delicious as Ibadat. So she goes for her Ibadat into her, into her healing hall. And there are many, many things that happen to her there. So thankfully, because I am her, also her daughter, sometimes I'm lucky because she's sharing these things with me or with some of the closest disciples that she has. She's not a public person. So she's, she, she's not a public person. She's not an orator. And she doesn't like to go in the public or speak her stories or talk or talk about the universe or God or her experiences or anything. Besides that, she comes from a Sufi lineage where hiding what, was ha what is happening with you, keeping it under the wrap, keeping it in a womb instead of exposing it is the practice. So it's very difficult for her to let go of that. Many times she doesn't understand how so many of us are able to just go on the stage or a Facebook live and talk about our experiences. But I'm going to give you a taste of Mother Rabia. So one of these mornings, she especially has a beautiful connection with the sun. And she stares for many hours. She can stare into the sun for many hours. And especially in her morning ibadat, she stares into the sun for a long time, unflinchingly. In one of those... Uh, moments. This this is this is something that happened in Koregaon Park in Pune, um, and she was in her flat. So she used to go on the terrace. At that point of time, there were no other buildings around when she used to go to the terrace. So the sun was right in front of her, and she could romance the sun for as long as she wanted. And then the buildings came up, and suddenly the sunrise became um, uh, was not visible. It got blocked. And this was something that actually sort of uh, was a disappointment, was a hurt, and she felt sad about it. She couldn't do anything about all the buildings, but then she did feel sad about it because now she had to wait longer in the, in the morning, maybe 8 o'clock, till she could see the sun. And so one of these days, she decided to just go up at a regular time, and she was looking there, and she started to see the sun in between these two buildings. There were two buildings and the sun was in between. A portion of the sun could be seen. As she was staring into the sun, the buildings stepped aside and the sun came out right in front of her face. Her causal mind while this was happening also thought this is not possible. The buildings cannot step aside. But she was too drenched. She was too gone. Light was everywhere. That morning when she came down, I was there and I saw her. I saw what I saw. I saw the sun itself. She told me this. And like a very innocent child who needs validation, because then by that time she had come to her causal self, her conditioned self. And she said, Gesu, do you think this is possible? Have I gone mad? Have I lost my mind? And I said, yes, you have lost your mind. It's only the one who loses his mind or her mind. In, it's only for a person who loses their mind will the sun bother to step up. The buildings will have to give in. Yes, you have lost your mind. This is only one of the experiences that I'm able to describe here of Mother Rabia. I have had the privilege of listening to many of her experiences because I'm also like a friend to her apart from being her daughter. I'm sort of a spiritual confidant. And so we come to know we speak to each other and she tells me, she honors me by telling me these experiences. In this day and age, many seekers, 
spiritual seekers, seekers of inner journey, have become spiritual orphans because they are not introduced to the field of the Guru, to the field of the mystic. They are not introduced to the womb of the mystic. Mother Rabia is an energy womb. It's a field. You step into the field. You don't come to a person. There is no person there. You come to a field and you will be able to see the field and you will be able to see the person. The person worries about whether you have eaten or not. The person will make sure that you have a good bed to sleep on. The person will give you chai on time. The person will make sure that you are comfortable. But the field will annihilate you. When you step into the field, the field will finish you off. In the field you realize how orphan you have been even though you had everything. In the field you realize the sense of homecoming. In the field you realize this is what I was looking for. In the field you realize, oh my God, this is the homecoming that my soul was yearning for. There are no marketing gimmicks there. There is no impressing you in first 30 seconds. There is no giving you lectures and talks. There is no need to impress you. There is a presence. You hear so much about presence. You hear so much about mindfulness. You hear so much about awareness. But so many people lack the taste of awareness, the taste of presence, the reality of presence. What does it feel like? What does presence feel like? We talk so much. What does presence feel like? That is what you experience when you come to Sufi mystic Mother Rabia. Presence. You see the paradox. The paradox of a woman, a mother, a caring, loving, nurturing woman, a playful woman, a caring mother. And then when she is in the initiation, doing your initiation, whether it's dynamic Reiki or navel awakening initiation or when you're sitting with her, in her field, you will see the universal mother unleashed. You will not be able to measure her aura. You will see the field. You will see the ascended masters standing, bowing to the great mother. If you have the capacity to handle a paradox, if you have the inner eye, the perception to surrender to this presence, you should Definitely, once in your life, meet Sufi mystic Mother Rabia. The unfortunate paradigm of today's spirituality is that we have faster, quicker, snappier facilitators, therapists, healers, gurus. But the world is losing out on the mystics. The real, the essence, the essence of inner journey is in the mystics. I cannot talk about Naval Awakening Initiation without talking about the founder Sufi mystic Mother Rabia. And I cannot talk about her just like that. I would like through this video, I'm trying to introduce to you what me and countless people who have come to her have sensed. The field that we have been in. The being that we have experienced. And because she doesn't know how to sell herself and I don't know how to sell a Sufi mystic or myself, we don't come from a fantastic background of great marketing skills. The only selling I can do is help you taste the truth. Now, uh, a little bit about why she is called 
Rabia. Mother Rabia was born as Shugufta in a small place in the downtown Srinagar, Kashmir. She was born to a Sufi mystic himself, but in their lineage, the Sufis had a family, raised a family, worked outside and did their regular business. It was only somewhere in the deep of the night that the mystics gathered together, whirled, danced, sung and spoke at length and experienced each other's energy and spoke at length about the universe. It was in an environment like this of seekers, thirsty seekers and mystics of different nature, Sufi mystics, Pandit mystics, Sikh mystics that came together and gathered with her father that sometimes the children were allowed to participate in the night rituals. It was in this environment she was raised. So inside her she had this deep yearning and she was a very very naughty girl for her time she was extremely naughty she wanted to do everything that the boys could do she wanted to do everything that girls were not allowed to do she wanted to drive that jeep she wanted to ride that cycle she wanted to wear the most fashionable clothes she wanted to have the most fashionable haircut she was fierce competitive she was good looking beautiful uh, she was followed she broke many hearts she was followed by many people by many men because they loved her and she was the kind of person who you wouldn't have seen you wouldn't have imagined in as a peaceful serene reflective guru she was vibrant she still is active on the go she still is but nobody had imagined that and nobody had imagined that even more because she went against everybody in her family and her culture and her religion fell in love with her own guru they both fell in love with each other they both came home to each other Vishwa Vijay, Vishwa Vijay Aftab, who now is her husband. This painful union where they were together was the ecstasy, ecstasy of two souls coming together and the pain of the entire society absolutely against it, including her loving father. He was a Rajput. My father was a Rajput, my mother, Mother Rabia, a Muslim Sayyid. Absolute opposite. But my father, Vishwa Vijay, a very loved, very close student of Acharya Rajneesh, now known as Osho. He is a madman, a mystic onto his own right. So he converted to Islam just to satisfy my grandfather, her father. But anyways, the story goes on. When you meet her, ask her or when you meet me, I will tell you the details. For now, this is just a background. And her inner search started. We were born, I was born, then my younger brother was born six years later. In this process, she came to the brink of death many times. Once, right in front of my eyes, she almost died and came back. When I was born, and that was 1978, I think I was a year or two older, and at one point she had become extremely sick. She was absolutely ill, she could not recover, and her husband, my father, knew that this was more spiritual than a physical illness. So he traveled with her to Pune so she could meet Acharya Rajneesh Osho. At that point of time, he was, I think, known as Bhagwan. She finally got the appointment. And in those days, it was very difficult to meet him. There were a lot of restrictions. There, were, there was a lot of discipline. 
that had to be followed and she was a very shy person she could not uh, speak for herself so many things happened in that process but finally when she got to meet him she entered the room she opened the door and osho bhagwan with his look the look that he had in his eyes you can go and search for his picture if you don't know him and see the look he looked up at her when he looked up at her he said ye to rabia hai she is rabia and as soon as ma heard this she describes it that as soon as she heard, heard it as if everything in her died she died a mountain was lifted she died she was annihilated nothing of her was left and while she was experiencing this she fell to the side and was lovingly held by one of the other osho sanyasis i think ma shakti if i'm not wrong for some time she was held because she was not in her senses and this was the answer she was crying and crying and crying she left from there she came out she met my father she was crying and this is from where her transformation her inner journey deepened but more importantly this is where the recognition of rabia that she is rabia this recognition this homecoming was gifted to her by osho and from there on she was known as rabia and rabia is the word that fits her completely because she is a mystic now she her journey spiritual journey is quite long and it would be nice if you came down to the retreat center you asked her she is a fantastic storyteller and um, all her students they just sit there spellbound she doesn't teach through um through scriptures or books or philosophies she teaches through stories and more of them are her own own stories her own life story so when you meet her she'll tell you more about her in her journey and i think that is the best way for now i'm going to shift to her becoming the founder of naval awakening initiation she had very recently received Uh, she had become a reiki teacher she had received a reiki initiation uh, she was very ill and she uh, a, a very dear friend of her said please do reiki but she said that i want you to do reiki not because of your illness but because i can see that's where your future is you will meet your destiny your life purpose but in that moment ma was very very ill she had arthritis she had gallbladder stone she had hypothyroid she had something else i forgot what but one more problem and she was not able to even stand up so all that she wanted in that moment was to get well so she wanted to try everything we had tried ayurveda we had tried yunani we had tried uh, meditation we had tried many things but nothing worked so she went to this reiki school which had just opened up and a japanese monk had had opened this school in pune she did her reiki and when she came home the first day i could see that from being an arthritic arthritis patient who was not able to get up and sit down she was only 40 or 45 i think 45 46 at that point of time she was flying to me she looked like she was hovering above the ground and she was flying she had come home and i witnessed her 21 days transformation and i felt like a girl had come out a woman had come out a lioness had come out a lover had come out a mystic had come out i was very young then in my teens i think i was 19 and i loved it that my mother had become this soon after she was guided by everybody that she had to do become a reiki teacher she was phenomenal but she never wanted to become a reiki teacher but she became a reiki teacher after she consciously asked the universe give me a clear sign if i should become a reiki teacher and you will probably smile why she was hesitant to become a reiki teacher 
however liberal she was, in her mind becoming a Reiki teacher and teaching Reiki probably went against her teachings, her Sufi teachings, Islamic teachings and Namaz and she thought maybe this was not what she should do. So she asked Allah, she asked God for a clear sign as a Muslim whether she should do it or not. I'm making, making, a, making it a point to mention that she asked clearly as a Muslim. That was the only doubt in her mind. There was no other doubt. That very morning after the night, early morning, she dreamt that there is a very, um, there's a very uh, divine, profound Darga um, in Srinagar. It's called Hazrat Bal. And she saw that it was the divine day when the divine relic from the great prophet is shown from the top of a minar and there are thousands, millions, thousands of people, millions of people actually standing underneath and they pray, they look at it, they pray, they try to commune with the great prophet. She saw in the dream that this which is called Ziyarat was being shown and when she looked up at it, she also saw that on the different minars were banners flying saying Reiki with Rabia. That morning she got up and she was celebrating all over the house. She was dancing. I asked, my father asked, my brother asked, what is it? And she shared it with my father and me that this is what I saw. This is my permission. And my father, the very next day, put up these banners, Reiki with Rabia across Koregaon Park. That's how it became famous, Reiki with Rabia. Soon she was steeped in it. She became a fantastic teacher. Her very first student was a French man. And um, in those days, it was in donation on donation basis. And people used to uh, give sometimes 500 or 1000 um, or 2000 rupees. But she he came to her and when he finished the course, he gave her 14,000 rupees. I'm mentioning it for a reason. And he said, you know, this is all I have right now because that was not the time for PayPal and everything. People actually carried their money. And he said, this, this is all I have left because I'm leaving. If I wasn't leaving, I would have given you everything. But I'm giving you this money for you to know your worth as a teacher and for you to continue your journey as a Reiki teacher. People like you, teachers like you are needed in this world. So Mother Rabia's Reiki school began and people from across the world came. We had, um, we had Iranians, we had French people, we had Germans. It was full of German people. We had people from Russia, we had people from America and especially there was a season of Israelis. There were a few years when we had so many Israelis coming. It was during this time that Mother Rabia was guided for a particular Israeli student called Roy. She's forever grateful for his presence and I would like to honor him by mentioning his name. It was Roy who was suffering from a deep issue and early in the morning Ma was guided. She made him lie down and it was there that she received the Naval Awakening Initiation she downloaded it, she received it, and while she received it, she performed it. What happened to Roy in the next four days was phenomenal. The fifth day, I remember coming back home from college and my whole house was transformed because he had bought carpets, he had bought things, he had, bought he had beautified the entire hall where Ma used to work. That was his way of gratitude. He donated money to make a center and he told Ma that again he was leaving and he said if if I wasn't leaving I would have given way more than this. You have no idea Rabia what you have done for me. You have no idea what this initiation is. And trust me she really did not have an idea just like an innocent 
child who invents something accidentally she really had no idea what she had stumbled upon what this universe had gifted to her it was years later as we steeped into it as we went deeper as we realized and as evidence started to come in and started to corroborate the spiritual insights and impulses and guidances that we were receiving that i was receiving about human navel that i realized and we realized and what we had been gifted with and it was then a few years later that we realized that the task of introducing what human navel is is what we came to do she is the experiential person she does the initiation she is the person who does the initiation mind you i do not do the navel awakening initiation nobody in the world except sufi mystic mother rabia does the navel awakening initiation she has trained no one no one has been authorized by her she has trained no one more about that later that's how the navel awakening initiation came into being and then many people received the initiation including me and as i received my initiation guidances poured in about human navel and i started to realize what ma was doing and more information came in so mother rabia is the founder of navel awakening initiation the initiation per se i am the founder of navel consciousness the wisdom per se and the wisdom has its own healing systems that can be done on yourself it's a self performing system that can be done on others the initiation cannot be replaced it's only done by ma the reason why i am stressing on it is because when we when uh, when this happened and i started talking about it on facebook or i wrote about it in newspapers immediately we started getting reports and i saw it on facebook i saw it on different mediums how people had just copy pasted what was written and they were fooling seekers genuine innocent sincere seekers in the name of uh, sufi navel initiation or navel initiation or whatever and many of them had the audacity to say that ma had trained them and they had learnt it so this is this probably is going on in many parts of india or somewhere else and we would like you to know i would like you to know that ma has not authorized anyone even i don't conduct the initiation when it's time she will declare she will train people and she will declare but right now she hasn't found anyone and she hasn't started the process of initiating uh teachers or initiators now in short what does the navel awakening initiation do to you and what is human navel this is the most important question that has come to me but more importantly i would like you to not get misled by the word by the sentence navel awakening initiation by the title the name that we have given to this initiation navel awakening initiation don't be misled by it don't assume the navel awakening initiation means awakening your navel your navel cannot be awakened or activated it is as foolish to consider that your navel is can be awakened or activated as it is to show a small tiny lamp to the sun when you hold a lamp in front of the sun there is a certain intrinsic foolishness to it if you consider that this is light and that is light you cannot awaken or activate your navel please do not try it because of the lack of understandable understand words that can make you understand it we had to i had to name it like this what it actually means is not that you awaken your navel what it means is you are being awakened to your navel you will awaken to your navel the navel awakening initiation so the navel cannot be awakened or activated or anything else that one can tell you what is human navel have you ever considered the fact why 
in the ancient Vedic wisdom are we told that the creator of this world, Brahma, was created from the navel of Vishnu. Vishnu is the sustainer. Vishnu breathes, the worlds come into being. Vishnu exhales, the worlds go out of existence. Why couldn't Vishnu just think the world into existence? Why did Vishnu need to produce a cord from the navel that produced a lotus and from where, from there Brahma was born? And then Brahma gave birth to the world. Have you ever wondered why the invincible Ravana, the great Bhakt of Shiva, could only be killed by striking his navel and that too by Rama, the avatar of Vishnu. Navel cannot be defined easily. And for this, I would only invite you to a workshop where I can explain it to you, show it to you, make you feel your navel and show you the graphical representation of the guidance that I have received. But in short, if I have to just excite your curiosity about navel, the navel is the departure point, it's the departure portal. What is a departure portal? Take a piece of paper and I would like you to draw a line on it. To be able to draw a straight line, you will have to put your pen down to the paper and start at a point. That point is the point of departure. That is the departure portal. So the whole existence is here. The consciousness is here. The consciousness became aware of itself and the existence came into being. That is the Shiv, Shiva, the consciousness, the darkness was still. Shakti, the awareness, the whim gave birth to creation. Thus Shiva and Shakti. But when you start to create from the consciousness, when from the infinite you create a finite form, you will need a departure portal. You will need the point at which the finite departs from the infinite. That departure portal, that connecting portal that keeps the holographic infinite into you and yet gives you the finite form, that portal is human navel. The closest, the closest example of the navel, the closest example that, that nobody has been able to see but has been observed otherwise are black holes in the space. That's the closest example of a navel. But more about it in a workshop, it's truly not the place where I can talk about what human navel is. What can you expect from the Naval Awakening Initiation? When you awaken to your navel, you awaken to your quantum being. Your quantum being is locked up inside the causal shell. That is the conditioning. It's locked up inside it. The conditioning is the cage. And navel is the place where both of these entities are locked up. If your navel is initiated, if you are plugged right back into the quantum field, which is what happens in the initiation, either your causal gets activated, right now your causal is activated, or your quantum gets activated. Your causal cannot get activated because it's active. It's in the deprivation mode. That's why the causal is there. I'm sorry if I'm, I'm sounding too technical, but this is how I can explain it. But when you get the initiation, the quantum being awakens. Your awareness of your own quantum being is what awakens. One of the greatest advantages of awakening to your quantum being and connecting back to this God self is that your life purpose becomes available to you. Most of the times we 
are thirsty, hungry, because we don't know what our life purpose is. And then we go for training. We train our mind to believe that this is my life purpose, that this is my contribution, that if I do this, if I be me, then I can contribute to the world. Please don't bother to be you. Me. Me. Me is a small entity that I see from the peephole of conditioning. Me is nothing. But in the nothing, there is everything. So be nothing. But how to be this nothing? How to be a nothing and still contribute? That quantum self, awakening to that possibility, is the greatest result of the Naval Awakening Initiation. But it may not strike you, it may not entice you, it may not excite you because the modern spiritual system gives you bullet points of what you can get when you do this therapy, when you do this modality, when you take this initiation. You have to be convinced by bullet points. You have to be told this is what is going to happen to your physicality, to your mentality, to your emotional body. This is what is going to happen to your spirituality. And when you are convinced by the bullet points and if the bullet points by any means are any different from anybody else, then you sign up for the workshop. If you are somebody who wants to get convinced by bullet points, this is not something for you. This is for seekers. This is for people who are interested in arriving. And once they arrive, then where they arrive, that destination tells them what can be. This is for people who want to arrive into God, into the source, and interact with the source and let the source and then speak to each other. Let the source guide you where to go. This is not for the people who are already carrying a baggage of this is my expectation, this is where I have to go. If this is your expectation, this is where you want to go, why the hell do you want to find out anything about quantum being? Stay causal, stay where you are, you're far better off there. I apologize for not being able to provide any bullet points. But in the next session, next Saturday, I will be giving you a breakup of the quantum being, a tiny minuscule breakup of the quantum being. What is a quantum being and what happens when you take the Naval Awakening Initiation or any workshop of Naval Consciousness. By this almost hour long lecture, I wish to awaken in you the curiosity, the thirst, the seeking of a lover. Become a lover of yourself, of God, of Source. Don't be a spiritual orphan. Spiritual orphans jump from one workshop, one teacher, one guru, to one modality, to another modality. And they go on collecting so much baggage, spirituality, inner work, reaching the source, arriving is about becoming empty. It is not about carrying more and more baggage. If at any given point of time you wish to become empty, you wish to become empty enough to become everything, everyone the omnipresent, then this is the path for you. I hope, I sincerely hope that the energy of Mother Rabia, the energy of mysticism, the energy of Naval Awakening Initiation, the energy of Naval Consciousness, the energy of your own Naval, the energy of everything there is, has reached you through this life. It has awakened in you the excitement of being a lover. In Hindi, there are better expressions. English cannot justify I feel English cannot really justify the, th uh, the spiritual thirst. But in Hindi or in Urdu, we say Ishq. Ishq ke haqiqi, 
इश्क मजाजी मजाजी नॉट मजाजी मजाजी इश्क मजाजी इश्क हकीकी एंड इश्क मजाजी इश्क करना जरूरी है यू हैव टू बी अ लवर वेदर कॉजल वेदर क्वांटम बट बी अ लवर सो डोंट बी जस्ट अ क्लाइंट बी अ लवर आई होप दिस हैज हेल्प्ड रिमेंबर दैट व्हिच इज एक्सटैटिक इज अबंडेंट दैट व्हिच इज अबंडेंट is always healthy ecstasy abundance health i am sending you a big wave of ecstasy abundance health see you next saturday